Aaron Swartz, programmer and internet freedom activist, takes his own life. You're watching Inside Story, Americas from Washington. Hello, I'm Shihab Rajatsi. Aaron Swartz began computer programming at the age of 12. By the time he was 14, he'd co-authored the RSS Internet Syndication Standard, which allows Internet users to aggregate content that interests them. He dropped out of Stanford University after a year. He then founded an Internet startup company called Infogami, which eventually merged with Reddit, a social news and entertainment website. Reddit was eventually sold to the magazine publisher Condé Nast. That made Swartz rich. He now focuses energy on campaigning for internet freedom, co-founding the advocacy group Demand Progress. He helped organize the successful campaign against the Stop Online Piracy Act, or SOPA, which sought to monitor the internet for copyright violations and shut websites down. In 2011, Swartz was charged with computer fraud, after being accused of illegally downloading some four million articles from the academic website JSTOR using the network of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Prosecutors alleged he aimed to make the articles freely available using peer-to-peer -peer websites. Had he been found guilty, he could have faced 35 years in jail and paid up to a million dollars in fines. He committed suicide on Friday. He had long struggled with depression. Underlying Swartz's work was a passionate belief that vigilance was needed to ensure that the Internet remained open to all and that restrictions were not quietly passed that would have a huge impact on all of our access to information. Here he is talking about the campaign against SOPA. There's a battle going on right now, a battle to define everything that happens on the Internet in terms of traditional things that the law understands. Is sharing a video on BitTorrent like shoplifting from a movie store? Or is it like loaning a videotape to a friend? Is reloading a web page over and over again like a peaceful virtual sit-in or a violent smashing of shop windows? Is the freedom to connect like freedom of speech or like the freedom to murder? This bill would be a huge, potentially permanent loss. If we lost the ability to communicate with each other over the internet, it would be a change to the Bill of Rights, the freedoms guaranteed in our Constitution, the freedoms our country had been built on, would be suddenly deleted. New technology, instead of bringing us greater freedom, would have snuffed out fundamental rights we'd always taken for granted. And it will happen again. Sure, it will have yet another name, and maybe a different excuse, and probably do its damage in a different way. But make no mistake, the enemies of the freedom to connect have not disappeared. The fire in those politicians' eyes hasn't been put out. There are a lot of people, a lot of powerful people, who want to clamp down on the Internet. And to be honest, there aren't a whole lot who have a vested interest in protecting it from all of that. Even some of the biggest companies, some of the biggest Internet companies, to put it frankly, would benefit from a world in which their little competitors could get censored. <laughs> I'm joined from Cambridge, Massachusetts by Lawrence Lessig. He's a professor at Harvard Law School and was a friend of Aaron Swartz. From Philadelphia, Tim Lee is a technology writer and adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. And from Los Angeles, Maria Bostios joins us. She covers technology for the all.com. I think what we want to do over the next 20 minutes or so is just to understand the principles that Swartz advocated and explain to some of our viewers why he's receiving so much coverage, um, at least in some quarters. Um, and perhaps to, to help do that, uh, Tim Lee, we can, we can begin by explaining some of the terms that we just used in the introduction. For example, RSS. Um, why, is that, why was that so important? How, how radical was that? How, how much of a child prodigy did it take to come up with that? Well, it's, it's something that's still widely used. Um, every morning when I get up and I want to look at uh, what, you know, what's been posted on the blogs I'm interested in, um, I look at what's called an RSS reader. And uh, it just goes out and it grabs um, copies of, of posts from various blogs and uh, lets me read them. And he helped develop that. So it was, it was, a, it was a big deal. Um, and it's something that's still, I mean, it's been updated since then. But the basic concept is still widely used today. And then, Maria, we, we mentioned Reddit. Um, what exactly is Reddit? How, how interesting is that to, to our internet usage now? 
Uh, it's very, it's a huge, huge website where uh, an enormous uh, gathering place for a discussion of all kinds of m news of the day, technological advances. Uh, the, pr the president uh, went on during the campaign. It's, it's that popular to interface with a, a wide group of people interested in media and technology and answer questions. And uh, he was one of the early developers of it, not almost a co-founder. So. Uh, what's interesting, part I suppose, of his Go ahead. I'm sorry. Part of his uh, contribution was technological, but I think people valued him so much because of his political activism and the way he straddled those worlds in such a responsible way for such a young man. Right. I mean, I think that's what's so interesting. He wasn't um, simply, I mean, <laughs> it's not simply, I suppose, but in, in, in a, a trailblazing internet entrepreneur. I mean, there were clearly other issues that he felt, you know, very deeply. Professor Lessig, um, you met him when he was still in his teens there. How did you come to hear of, of Aaron Swartz? Yeah, I met him when I was giving talks at these internet conferences, and this, you know, 13-year-old was being chaperoned by his parents to attend these conferences to talk about internet policy issues. Uh, and from that age, you know, we started a friendship. Um, and, and what was striking to me was that this was one of those few technologists who looked up from his computer screen long enough to recognize how what he was doing could affect issues that he thought was important. Um, so he was an early architect of Creative Commons infrastructure to license content freely on the internet. He was a supporter of the Open Library Initiative at the Archive. All of these were examples of how he could make something valuable from his technology. And I think the important point is, later in his very tragically short life, he, he turned that into activism around social policy generally. So I think this was an idealist through his whole 26 years. But Professor Lessig, I mean, you're one, if not the foremost proponent of the, um, you know, the need for us all to have access to knowledge, the, the, the dangers of copyright law being misused to present prevent us from having access. Give us a sense of the sort of discussions you had with him. What sort of principles um, were, were important to, to both you and, and, and Aaron? Yeah, I mean, the basic point was that the system of laws that were, you know, architected for the analog world, written in the 1970s, or li literally, uh, didn't make sense in a digital world. Not because copyright doesn't make sense. Copyright's important. But that the way that copyright is implemented in a digital infrastructure doesn't make sense, so it needed to be updated. But there were people, forces, that he talked about in that introductory lecture that were not interested in updating copyright because they benefit from the arcane system that they have. And, and the United States government has become a vigilant prosecutor in the name of, these, of this system. So, so that's what I think was at stake in this prosecution that ultimately I think drove him to despair. But isn't this simply about protecting the rights of authors of content? No, it's not, not at simply all about that at all. Uh, Maria, go ahead. Yeah. But, but generally, yeah, the, the yeah, principles well, that are at stake here, there, I guess, is what we want to get at there. I mean, what, in, in, in the sense that there mm -hmm. are some um, vaguely ambivalent um, articles about Aaron now, which say, look, we, we, we think what he was doing was brilliant. But in the end, though, he went a bit far, perhaps. We do need some protections. And perhaps he was going beyond what even Professor Lessig was advocating. No, I don't, well, I don't think well, there's any reason to think that. I, I, mean, if, if, I, don't, if, I don't really buy that, no. All right, Professor Lessig, I mean, have you seen that? I mean, there was some mention of, you know, his, his, his guerrilla, well, the, the guerrilla open access manifesto, which he was said to have written and so forth. Did, was he very much, he wasn't against all copyright then, was he? No, he was not against all copyright. Creative Commons is an infrastructure for someone licensing their copyright. But, you know, I think the most important issue here is not so much what he was trying to do, but the government's response to what he was trying to do. So even if you think what he was doing was wrong, which I understand people taking the view that what he was doing was wrong, and, and I've even criticized some of the steps if it was true as it was alleged that he was doing. Even if it was wrong, the question is proportionality. So was this the equivalent of releasing the names of all of our spies to the world, or was this equivalent of dumping the social security database? Obviously not. These were academic journal articles he was downloading to his computer. He didn't hack anybody to do it. It was a simple script he wrote to download this information. But in, f in, the f in the face of this, the government was prosecuting him for 13 felonies and demanding he serve time in jail. And that was the extremism that I think right. was so important in explaining why he became so, you know, 
pathologically depressed about what was happening there. I'd still like to sort of build up this chronology of, of Aaron's life before we get specifically to, to JSTOR. Um, Maria, I mean, the, one of the first moments of activism uh, that brought him to, to notice was that the, um, his campaign against PACER in 2008. Perhaps you can explain what that was about. PACER is a government database of uh, legal records, and they were charging, the government was charging eight cents per page for accessing those records at one time. There was an activist, Carl Malamud, and Professor Lessig knows more about this than I do, but he, there was a, he called for these records that are paid for with you know, taxpayer money, and uh, Malamud thought that they should be free to anybody in the public to access. So then there was a, um, a trial period where PACER offered its its uh, materials to free to the public, and Aaron Swartz automated a download of those materials. So I think it was 20 million documents, and th the feds did not like that. And this was the beginning, I think, of his uh, touchy relations with them. And I think it, you know, put later developments in a in a very bad light with the uh, government authorities. But, but and I'd like to go back to to the to the Guerrilla Access Manifesto, mm. it's very important to make a distinction between Swartz's activism with respect to copyright. He was not looking for people who are rights holders not to be able to get paid. He, d he wasn't one of these people who thought there should be no such thing as copyright. He wanted to liberate, for example, public access documents and you know documents that we pay for as taxpayers, like in research institutions and elsewhere, that those documents that should be free to, for people to access them and use them, that they should be used. And, and that really is what he was about. He wasn't about, you know, trying to rip anybody off. Right. It wasn't a Napster deal or anything like that. I think it's very important to make that distinction. Basically, information that we've paid for that's being put up behind walls and we're being made to pay for. Yes, right. yeah, that's, that's, that's the Pacer story. Yeah. Well, that brings us also then to JSTOR, um, with your, your mention of, of, uh, of scholarly research that's being done using public, <laughs> public funding. Tim Lee, perhaps you can explain exactly what JSTOR is, journal storage. What was the, what was the problem with that as far as Aaron, uh, Aaron was concerned? Well, so I, th I think it's really important to understand how academic publishing usually works. Um, with many types of works, you know, you buy the work and then a, a chunk of that money goes to the authors. Um, that's not how academic publishing works. Um, with academic publishing, um, the, the professors or grad students who submit the journals usually don't get any money and all the revenue goes to sort of fund the infrastructure for publishing um, the material. And of course with the advent of the internet, um, most of that infrastructure is no longer necessary because you can just take the document and you can put it online and you know there's still, you have to edit it and stuff so it's not completely free. But Aaron believed that there were, there were much better ways where you wouldn't need to charge the end user for these documents that were not commercial blockbusters. These are usually very dry technical papers, um, often published, uh, funded by, you know, grants from the federal government or from private foundations. And um, in, in his view, what was happening was you had these, uh, these publishers who uh, really were not adding any value to the process, but were extracting a large amount of money. Um, and so JSTOR was a nonprofit organization that sort of aggregates a lot of these articles. And if you're on a college campus, um, you have, most college campuses have subscriptions where you have free access, but the rest of the country and the rest of the world doesn't have free access. And so what Aaron wanted to do, uh, it's not actually clear what he wanted to do, but um, what, he, what he did was he went to MIT, which has one of these subscriptions, um, and began rapidly downloading these articles. Um, the government alleges that he was planning to release them to the public, although I'm somewhat skeptical of that <coughs> because it, you know, it, that, it's not clear that would have been practical. For whatever reason, uh, he, maybe he wanted to do some other kind of research with the articles, but as with the P Pacer case, he wrote a script that rapidly downloaded these articles, um, probably to make some kind of point um, about the, uh, what he saw as the injustice of taking these documents that um, I, I think most people would agree ought to be available right. freely online. Professor Lessig. Uh, not Professor, I mean, is there a sense then that you know, we, we don't know uh, the motivations of Aaron, at least, at least we don't, but um, these are principles, I mean, these are fundamental principles about the um, availability of knowledge in order to you know, keep civilization moving along, I suppose, in some ways. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly what he was fighting for in many different contexts. It was craziness about restrictions that didn't make any sense, even for the copyright owners. That was the, that's the great point that's already been made about you know, academic authors only want their material accessible. Um, and you know, the great tragedy in this is that 
you know, JSTOR, I think, behaved very well from the very beginning. They said they didn't want to prosecute Aaron. They didn't want to civilly sue Aaron. And three days before Aaron's suicide, I don't even know if Aaron knows this uh, or knew this, three days before his suicide, JSTOR announced a policy where anybody around the world could get access to their material for free if they registered with JSTOR. So this idea that copyright was blocking the purpose of the authors is exactly the kind of craziness that Aaron was attacking. Aaron did not go to the Universal Film Database and download Universal's films because I think Aaron had a view that copyright has a function in certain contexts, but it didn't have a function here, and that was what was motivating, I think, what he was doing in this download. All right, so as you say, JSTOR did not want to proceed with prosecution, but federal prosecutors did go ahead. And here are some of the uh, charges in the indictment. The government accused him of breaking into a cupboard containing computer wiring at MIT. The indictment claims that he configured a laptop to access MIT's computer network and then downloaded those four million articles from JSTOR, uh, the archive of scientific journals and academic papers. Swartz was accused of wire fraud, computer fraud, illegally obtaining information, and recklessly damaging a protected computer. The charges could have resulted in up to 35 years in prison and one, a $1 million fine. The question, I suppose, Maria, is what was motivating this case if JSTOR didn't want to go ahead? And how strong were these cases as, as written in the indictment? MIT. Uh, was involved, JSTOR did not want to prosecute, and, and if MIT presumably had taken the same path that JSTOR did and uh, not involved federal authorities as early in their investigation as they did, um, it seems likely on the evidence that we have so far that they w couldn't have taken the prosecution as far as they did. Do we understand the I mean, motivation? The, this cabinet wasn't even locked. Right. I mean, the cabinet at MIT wasn't even locked. Aaron Swartz had every right to access all the JSTOR documents he wanted. He had an account from his home institution at Harvard. He had guest privileges at MIT. His, his dad was like a, um, a consultant to the IT department at MIT. He was a known academic figure. There was nothing stopping him from accessing JSTOR documents. So this wasn't the problem. The problem that the U.S. Attorney's Office so overzealously you know, went after is that he'd gone in this closet and hooked up a computer and uh, foiled attempts at detection so that he could w whoosh down all these documents onto a computer. What he wanted to do with those documents, we don't know and aren't going to, I, I imagine. I think there's every reason to suppose that he would have stripped out any copyright protected information in those downloads and never even made them available to the public. It would not have been difficult. Right. The preponderance of what he downloaded was in the public domain. So there's so much about this that it just got out of hand completely. And I'm, I'm sure everybody at MIT regrets the way that things right. turned uh, out the way they did. An inquiry is, on, is set to be underway at MIT, but, but Aaron Swartz's parents mm -hmm. and partner did release this statement which read, Aaron's uh, death is not simply a personal tragedy, it's the product of a criminal justice system rife with intimidation and prosecutorial overreach. Decisions made by officials in the Massachusetts U.S. Attorney's Office and at MIT contributed to his death. The U.S. Attorney's Office pursued an exceptionally harsh array of charges carrying potentially over 30 years in prison to punish an alleged crime that had no victims. Meanwhile, unlike JSTOR, MIT refused to stand up for Aaron and its own community's most cherished Principles, Professor Lessig. I suppose we'll, we'll leave MIT's motivations to the inquiry that's underway. But when we look at the prosecutor's motivations, is it clear why they went after Aaron so ferociously? Yeah, I think it is. You know, the whole case began around the time that Bradley Manning and the WikiLeaks uh, matters were happening, and I think the government felt, you know, they had to make an example that nobody was going to get by with any breach of uh, these wildly overbroad computer laws, which now we have congresswoman after congressman standing up saying we've got to do something about these computer laws. So they wanted to make an example. But you know, that's, that's what just outrages me the most, because they're making an example with somebody's life. They were destroying this kid's life. They knew it. They knew that this was going to destroy him. They spent two years or 18 months negotiating, recognizing how it was bleeding his resources dry. Uh, and, and, you know, they do it in the context of such weak claims of harm by anybody. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, they can make an example of it. They can behave like a bully. But, you know, sometimes when you behave like a bully, people really lose. And, and in this case, this 
all of us lost this extraordinary activist and idealist to the terror of this prosecution. Tim Lee, I mean, as we look at that indictment and the use Is of things like the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, what ramifications might that have on all of us had the prosecutors succeeded in their case against Aaron Swartz? Yeah, so, you know, you just have uh, to understand the trigger of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is that you have violated the terms of service for the site that you've accessed. So, you know, those little click-through terms of service or the terms of service that are put on the website, if you violate those, what the government says is that you've become a trespasser, a computer trespasser, and you can be prosecuted as a felon. Well, you know, the whole question is whether the government should be transforming these rules on a website into felony prosecutions. But they didn't back down in this case. They said, absolutely, it's a felony prosecution, it's a wire fraud prosecution, and Aaron Swartz was told he had to go to jail, and they were not going to settle for anything less than that. That is the extremism that I think anybody involved in federal prosecution shakes their head and say, why would you take such an extreme position here? And the answer is, you know, I know lots of prosecutors, they're decent people, they're doing, uh, they're doing the right thing, but there are prosecutors that go rogue, and we need a way to question that rogue prosecution here. You know, MIT said we're going to appoint a panel, and we have this great professor, Hal Abelson, who's going to oversee what we did and tell us what, what we did wrong. I think that's exactly what the U.S. The US attorney in, in Boston should do. She should appoint somebody independent to look at this and say, this is what the United States government believes in, or we believe this, this prosecutor went too far. Timothy Lee, though, I mean, is there any evidence, though, that, that, that the prosecutors know what they're doing? They aren't simply bumbling through this using a rather old set of legal precedents and standards. That they are, there is some almost central attempt to set legal precedents when it comes to issues of uh, the use of the Internet right now. Yeah, I, th I think this is one of the, the underlying problems, is that you, you have this, this law that was um, passed in the 1980s called the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And, you know, we, we, we know a lot more about how the online world works now than we did in the 1980s. And this 1980 statute doesn't really give us very much clarity about what, you know, constitutes quote unquote computer hacking and what, what doesn't. Um, and as a result, what, what happens is that the prosecutors, as a practical matter, have a great deal of discretion because um, we don't have very much case law that says so you know, what is or isn't. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Professor Lessig, do, do go ahead. Uh, I think we're losing Professor Lessig at this point. Professor Lessig, thank you very much for joining us. We'll continue the conversation uh, with Maria and Timothy for the moment. Timothy, go ahead. Sorry, you're in the middle of something. Yeah, so the, um, w what this means in practice is that the pr prosecutors have a great deal of discretion about who they want to charge and for what. Um, and I think a lot of things that um, you know, people, especially computer programmers, do uh, are kind of in this legal gray area where um, probably it's not, I mean, certainly it's not um, the sort of thing that you should have to serve long jail times for. Um, but people don't really know where the lines are. And that means that if a prosecutor decides they don't like you, for in, in this case, if um, you, know, the, you, you had Aaron where he uh, did his, the, the pacer uh, activity a couple of years ago, I think perhaps the prosecutors had a grudge against him for that. Um, and then along comes this sort of second incident. I think they, they decided they couldn't press charges for the first one because he hadn't actually done anything wrong. Um, but for this new one, they decided they could make a plausible case under this vague statute. <laughs> Um, and then they can pile on charge after charge because the, the law is so, so uh, vague and because it's, you, know, you can get five years in prison per charge. They can put a tremendous amount of pressure on the guy. Um, and he, you know, I think had he lived, he would have been under a tremendous amount of pressure to settle rather than actually going to trial, which means we never would have gotten clarity about whether the, the prosecution's interpretation of the law was correct or not. Maria, we only have 30 seconds left, but I wonder if you can just tie this in with his, his great victory against SOPA and all the campaigns he was, he was undertaking to ensure uh, the freedom of the Internet. Actually, we've only got about 20 seconds left. This was a man who cared enormously about individuals being able to use the internet for good and, and valuable reasons. It wasn't for personal gain or anything else. And everything that he did was, you know, based on that. So it's a real shame that we've lost him. Maria Bustillos, thank you very much. Timothy Lee, thank you. And we also thank Professor Lawrence Lessig for his time. And that's all from the team in Washington, D.C. for now. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Facebook, where you can find more information about the program. And we want to hear from you. Tell us what stories you think we should be covering. Send your ideas directly to us at InsideStory at AlJazeera.net.